So back in the 1970s, my mom was a teenager living in Houston. She and her nine siblings lived in the Heights, which she says is a nice neighborhood now, but at the time was something of a slum. Her family was super, super poor. Anyways, my mom had a crush on one of her brother's friends. She was around 14 or 15 at the time. He was a few years older, but she was in love. His name was Mark. Well, around this time, boys started disappearing from the neighborhood. They weren't leaving notes or telling anyone that they were leaving. The families were calling the police, but the police weren't doing anything about it. They decided that the boys had run away and never really looked into it further. After all, these were poor kids living in a bad neighborhood. They ran away all the time. Life goes on. One day, Mark disappears, too. Meanwhile, my mom's younger brother is hitching a ride out to the beach to go fishing. He did this on a regular basis and would bum a ride from anyone. On the way to the beach, the guy driving the car stops to fill up the gas tank. The guy working at the gas station, mom says they called him Weird Larry, sees my uncle and asks who he's with. My uncle replies that he doesn't actually know the guy. Larry won't let my uncle go any further and makes him get out of the car. The driver goes on without him. Now then, three years have passed since boys started disappearing, and they finally find out what happened. A man had been paying two boys to lure teenage boys to his house, where he drugged them, strapped them to a wooden board, tortured them, raped them, and killed them. There were at least 28 victims, and Mark Scott was one of them. The only reason they found out was because the two teenagers murdered the serial killer, then told the police about all of the murders and led them to some of the bodies. And guess who picked up my uncle that day he was going fishing? About ten years ago, I was recently divorced and living alone in a one-bedroom apartment. The place was clean and the rent was decent. One of those places that had a doorman, I felt safe here. I was alone and loving it, focused on my career and not on my clingy ex-husband. Things were finally looking up for me. At the time, I was working pretty late at the office and would often stumble into my apartment sleep deprived in the early hours of the morning and wake up by 6.30, 7-ish to start the day. I started noticing that in the morning my door would be unlocked sometimes. I usually dismissed this as my sleep-dead brain, thinking that the bed looked more appealing than locking the door. Another thing that I noticed since moving in was that I seemed to misplace things more than I used to. Little things like a hairbrush or nail polish, that sort of thing. It wasn't really that big of a deal, just enough to be a slight annoyance in my day. The longer I lived there, the more frequently I seemed to forget to lock the door. At first it was every once in a while, then it seemed like an almost daily occurrence. More things went missing, things like pictures, shaving razors, and most disturbingly, my underwear. This went on for long enough that I started to get a little paranoid. I started to take the time at night to make sure the door was locked. I got into a habit of every night after I locked the door to turn the handle three times and say to myself, it's locked, it's locked, it's locked. Time after time, I would wake up and the door would be unlocked. One time I even tried staying up all night to watch the door, but I ended up falling asleep in my chair. I decided that my mind was not reliable enough to stay up all night, so I invested in a video camera. I went all out and bought the fanciest camera that I could get my hands on. So one night I set the camera up facing the door. I hid the camera under a pile of towels on the floor. I locked the door and went to bed. When I woke up, my apartment looked normal. Nothing missing that I could see. I decided to check the tape. I fast-forwarded through hours of footage, not seeing anything. I was just about to give up when I noticed the handle of the door jitter. Then it slowly crept open. A figure slid through the half-opened door and walked towards the camera. It paused, looked around as if it was listening for something, then walked forward into direct view of the camera. I paused the camera. The hairs on my arms and the back of my neck started to rise. I was staring directly into the face of the maintenance man of the building. I could see those big, thick glasses and curly hair. I had no doubt who it was. I played the tape a little more. He looked comfortable as he walked around the apartment. Then he turned and walked towards my bedroom and out of the view of the camera. I didn't know what to do. Sobbing, I called the police. I tried to explain over the phone but couldn't. Soon enough, two officers arrived at my doorstep. I told them everything and showed them the tape. 
I remember seeing the blood drain from their faces. They promised me that I was safe and that they were going to get this guy. I needed to lay down, but didn't want to be alone. One of the officers offered to stand outside my apartment door as I took a nap. As I was laying in bed, unable to sleep, but to drained to move, something kept nagging at me. I laid there for a few minutes, tossing and turning, unable to get comfortable or rest. My mind was racing. Then a realization slowly washed over me and chilled me to the bone. We watched the tape and saw the man enter my home, but we never saw him leave. I froze, then started shaking. I needed to get to the front door. I sat up and looked around the room. I couldn't see anyone. I swung my legs over the side of the bed cautiously. My feet hit the cold wood floor and I felt warm breath on my ankles. I raced out of my apartment as fast as I could and to the safety of the police officer. He called for backup. They found the man under my bed, clutching a knife and a Polaroid camera.